Welcome to our eighth digital salon, Psychosocial Wednesdays. Today I welcome, or we welcome rather, Paul and I, uh, Mark Winborn, who will talk about the Liber Novus and the metaphorical psyche, revisioning the Red Book. The publication of the Liber Novus 11 years ago was met with intense curiosity and excitement <clears throat> it offered a window into Jung's inner experiences and the possibility of revealing links between Jung's, Jung's theories, his personal experience, and his prophetic vision. For many readers, the publication of Viva Novus has provided these connections. Some readers assert that Jung's collected works can no longer be fully understood without being framed by the content of Viva Novus. However, around the time of the publication, a significant re-examination of Jung's concepts of archetypes and collective unconscious was underway. Additionally, there has been an explosion of research on metaphor as the primary avenue by which human experience is digested and communicated. This talk by Mark, <clears throat> will use the Liber Novus as a springboard to propose a re-entering of analytical psychology from a psychological centered theory on archetypal theory to a, uh, centered to a metaphorical processes of the psyche. This re-centering has useful implications for the practice of Jungian analysis or interactions with others, psychoanalytic school or schools of thought, and our capacity <clears throat> to interact more, eff more effectively and meaningfully with the world we engage with. That's the introduction. And now let me introduce Mark uh, shortly. Mark Winborn, he is a Jungian psychoanalyst and clinical psychologist. Mark is a training and supervisor training analyst and a supervisor for the Inter-Regional Society of Jungian Analysis and at the Jung Institute in Zurich, or rather Kusnacht. He currently serves on the board of the, on the American Board of Accreditation and Psychoanalysis, Psychoanalysis and the Ethics Committee of the IAAP, as well as at the editorial boards of the Journal of Analytic Psychology and the Journal of Humanistic Psychology. He has presented papers at the past four congresses of the IAP. His publications include Deep Blue, Human Soundscapes for the Archetypal Journal, Shared Realities, Participation Mystique and Beyond, and Interpretation of Jungian Analysis, Art and Technique. Mark, I give the floor to you. Uh, thank you, Bernard, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, what I'll be speaking of is, about is from a chapter that appears in Volume 4 of Murray Stein and Thomas Arts, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. And as many of you probably know, Thomas Arts passed away this past spring. Uh, but he communicated with me before passing away unexpectedly. Uh, upon reading my chapter, he said, well, it's certainly provocative. So I'll be interested to see whether others find it provocative today. So what was Jung attempting to do in Liber Novus? Jung actively conducted his personal self-experimentation from 1913 through 1916 experiences which helped him shape the technique of active imagination. 
following his difficult break with Freud, it was through this prolonged period of self-exploration that Jung hoped to discover and live into his myth. These experiences were initially recorded in his black books. Sam Dashani indicates that the black books are not diaries of events, and very few dreams are noted in them. Rather, they are the record of an experiment. Jung indicates that he was utilizing autobiographical material, but not writing in the form of autobiography. From 1915 through 1930, Jung worked on extracting, shaping, and refining the content of the black books into the more focused narrative of Liber Novus. Jung then abandoned his work on Liber Novus until resuming it, the process three years before his death, ultimately leaving the project unfinished in mid-sentence. Samdashani describes Liber Novus as a series of active imaginations woven together with several underlying objectives. I quote, an attempt to understand himself and to integrate and develop the various components of his personality. To understand the structure and of the human personality. In general, to understand the relation of the individual to present day society. To understand the psychological and historical effects of Christianity and to grasp the future religious development of the West. Liber Novus can be understood as depicting Jung's individuation process and, has, and as his elaboration of this concept as a general psychological schema, unquote. In addition, according to Tom Dashani, Jung held that the significance of these fantasies was due to the fact that they stemmed from the mythopoetic imagination, which was missing in the present rational age. Hence, another objective in creating Liber Novus was to establish the archetypal foundation of the psyche, and therefore the existence and influence of the collective unconscious. However, Warren Coleman argues, Jung seems to have had little interest in tracing the actual historical origin of the archetypes of the collective unconscious, since he assumed that the archetypes were the same everywhere, and this provided him with a means of interpretation that could be universally applied, the question of origins may have seemed unimportant or even missing the point that the psyche is not bound in time, but is eternal. When engaging with Liber Novus, it is essential to recognize that the volume is not a straightforward record of Jung's dialogues with his unconscious. In Jung's initial draft of the Red Book, approximately 50% of the material is taken directly from the Black Books, along with 35 sections of new material added. Therefore, a significant amount of commentary is added to Jung's original dialogues, which were shaped and refined to support some of Jung's underlying objectives for Liber Novus, whether consciously or unconsciously held. Jung's vision for Liber Novus was also significantly influenced in both form and style by the Bible, Dante's Divine Comedy, Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Goethe's Faust, medieval illuminated manuscripts, and the eliminated works of William Blake. While it is clear that Jung's self-experiment reveals a great deal of his struggles with various psychic influences and the impact of the world on his psyche, it is also clear that Liber Novus is a creative expression emanating from Jung. He had arrived at some conclusions about his experiences that shaped the tone, content, structure, and style of Liber Novus in order to highlight his conclusions, just as a photographer, painter, or poet shapes their creative output to create or convey a particular effect. I think there's a danger in idealizing Liber Novus as a revelatory text in which we're invited into the inner sanctum of Jung's psyche. While it is appropriate to view Liber Novus as a process of self-experimentation, discovery, and transformation, it is also important to see that it is a creative act that emerged out of Jung's confrontation with the unconscious, just as all the arts share a common foundation in the articulation of human feeling and experience. As Jung puts it, the main value of a work of art does not lie in its causal development, 
but in its living effect upon ourselves. With this groundwork outlined, I'll shift to take a closer look at the relationship between archetypal theory, affect, imagination, and metaphor. In the contemporary Jungian world, we can no longer speak of archetypes, archetypal theory, or the collective unconscious as universally accepted theoretical constructs. There is currently significant debate within the Jungian community regarding the origin and transmission of archetypes. In recent years, new conceptualizations have emerged which question or modify Jung's original positions regarding the pre-existent or innate qualities of archetypes and the collective unconscious. More recent conceptualizations of archetypal theory include proposals that archetypes are primarily culturally determined and transmitted, or are manifestations of emergent developmental patterns resulting of the interaction of human systems. These early patterns form the initial scaffolding, image schemas, or action patterns that structure how later experience in, experiences in life will be internalized and responded to. This perspective is actually quite similar to Daniel Stern's concept emerging from infant developmental studies of what he calls representations of internalized experiences generalized or RIGS for short, which shape how later experience is perceived, interpreted, and responded to. We can also see some similarity with Bowlby's concept of internal working models, which is associated with attachment theory. According to Christian Rossler, it must be concluded that there is still no firm scientific foundation for the claim that complex symbolic patterns, as for example, the myth of the hero, can be transmitted in a way that every human individual has access to them. More explicitly, Rossler states, if we accept that the transmission of what we call archetypes depends much more on interaction and cultural processes than Jung ever thought, we might be able to develop concepts like that of the cultural complex. In this sense, we are not born with a collective unconscious, we grow into it. Adopting a more pluralistic stance, Francois Martin Velez proposes that archetypes possess both biological and emergent properties. That is, that the archetypes have biological and transmissible origins interacting with cultural influences to determine the activation and expression of the archetype. He says, I am proposing that the archetype is an emergent structure a byproduct of the encounter between culture and instinct. In other words, a higher level of complexity. Patricia Scar proposes that we no longer need the archetype as such to explain the formation of complexes. She says, in fact, we could do without it altogether and still have the same basic psychological system that Jung proposed. Finally, Warren Coleman, in his book, Act and Image, deconstructs Jung's reasoning, which led to his theory of archetypes in the collective unconscious. Coleman offers a different perspective that emphasizes the role of the social and material environment in the construction of symbolic thought and imagination. In doing so, his aim is to cut across the traditional arguments between culture and biological, origins of the archetypes by showing that this kind of dispute, like the nature versus nurture dispute, with which it's linked, is based on a misapprehension of human nature for which culture is biological. Coleman continues, rather than seeing archetypal images as being derivative of the structure of a collective psyche composed of the fundamental forms of archetypes in themselves, Rather, what we see in Jung is a lifelong fascination with working out of symbolic imagination through human history and culture. Coleman argues that Jung's concept of archetypes as innate experiences has outlived its theoretical utility, and he proposes a focal shift towards symbolic imagination, 
as an emergent and unique phenomenon of the human species. Coleman's redefinition of the Jungian focus has similarities with Bionian ideas of dreaming oneself into existence and coming into being, which Bion associated with the patient's capacities for reflective thought and learning from experience. Ultimately, the question regarding the nature and origin of archetypal patterns is more essential from a theoretical perspective than in the context of how the analyst practices clinically. For the purposes of analytic interaction, it is the archetype as experience, that is the phenomenology of archetypal experience, descriptive of an element emerging in the analytic field, intrapsychically or in life, that is most essential rather than the origins of the archetypal images or themes. Speaking along similar lines, Jung himself writes, I would not give priority to understanding, for the important thing is not to interpret and understand the fantasies, but primarily to experience them. In other words, archetypal patterns can be utilized to describe and engage with the experience of experiences of the patient and the analyst that possess a something more than ordinary experience. A theoretical position regarding the origin of archetypes is not necessary for the use of the concept as a descriptive category of experience. Experiences having a ring of universality, inherent order or transcendence to them can be engaged without necess necessitating an attribution about the location or origin of these experiences. In the clinical setting, the focus is on the immediacy and quality of the experience, just as Otto articulated numinosity and awe as qualities of religious experience. Similarly, the exploration of archetypal motifs in the analytic setting can be functionally effective and transformative regardless of the theoretical genesis of archetypal experience. If we accept that archetypal theory and the concept of the collective unconscious is open for re-examination, then we need to consider what is the foundational element of human experience. If the foundation of human experience is not rooted in the collective unconscious, as Jung argues, then what is it rooted in? According to Margaret Browning, who incorporates research on primary emotion, neuroscience, and the work of philosopher Susan Longer, the most fundamental layer of human experience is rooted in our affective experience. Browning argues, in the human species, affect not only motivates learning about the world, it also forms the basis of our symbolic minds. Continuing, she states, we may equate affect with the capacity to feel and state that it is the projection of feeling into form that is the basis of symbolic process. Affectivity is the subcortical core of subjectivity. The affective focus in Longer's philosophy is supported by research into primary emotions, that is, those emotions that all humans share across cultures as well as being the emotions that all other complex emotional states are built upon. As St Lewis Stewart describes from a Jungian perspective, the affects are the lifeblood of the psyche. The affects are the bridge between body and psyche, instinct and spirit. These primal affects have, a universe, have universal forms of facial expression and bodily innervations. However, Langer also highlights the distinctive connection between symbols and affective consciousness. Browning summarizes that relationship as follows. Symbols depend on the capacity to render affect into external form, most notably language. Psychoanalysis has always privileged lang affect as the basis of our mental lives, but it has not necessarily recognized affect of, as the basis of our uniquely symbolic minds and the import this has for our psychoanalytic theory and treatment. End quote. 
Language is not abstract and divorced from symbolic process. Affect, which arises from soma, pushes for expression through symbolic thought, typically mediated through language. Browning elaborates on the relationship between affect, symbolic thought, and individuation, saying, the riches of a symbolic culture are vast, but they are always wielded from an emotional base. This capacity to feel, this affective consciousness, is the very basis of our unique symbolic minds, with which, to a considerable degree, we create ourselves. Browning also notes, of special importance for longer is the role of imagination. What the early appearance of symbolic communication afforded has some voluntary control over this faculty for imagining. Feeling is what the human species utilizes in its unique fashion to create symbols. Symbols that embed us in a culture mediated by these very symbols themselves. At this point, having reconsidered archetypal theory, as well as presenting arguments for somatically grounded affects as the prime, prime mover within psyche, I now shift to my main point of emphasis, that metaphor is the primary mode for the transformation of psychic experience. Now, I'm by no means the first Jungian to underscore the importance of metaphor. Ellen Siegelman, 30 years ago, published a book, Metaphor and Meaning in Psychotherapy, which is a marvelous book, and she refers to the first chapter is called The Primacy of Metaphor. But 30 years ago, she didn't have access to the same level of contemporary research in the cognitive science, the neurosciences, and the philosophy of mind that exists now to support her arguments in favor of metaphor. George Lockoff and Mark Johnson indicate that the human mind is inherently embodied, that thought is mostly unconscious, and that abstract concepts are largely metaphorical. So what is metaphor? Metaphor involves the utilization of one conceptual or imaginal domain to map or articulate the experience of a different conceptual or imaginal domain. Therefore, it transfers meaning between domains of experience, from conscious to unconscious, from cognitive to somatic, from somatic to affective, from past to present, and present to future, linking realms in ways not previously seen, and transforming meaning by means of novel rec recombinations between domains. For example, a simple metaphor. The ship's prow plows the sea is a metaphor that reveals the similarity between the prow of a ship passing through the water and a plow passing through the soil. Lockoff and Mark Turner describe metaphor as a tool so ordinary that we use it unconsciously and aut automatically. It is omnipresent. Metaphor suffuses our thoughts, no matter what we are thinking about. Metaphor allows us to understand ourselves and our world in ways that no other modes of thought can. Metaphor is constantly used, both consciously and unconsciously, in everyday life. Everyday speech is filled with metaphor. I'm all tied up in knots. The weight of the world is on my shoulders. I feel trapped. It feels like somebody is standing on my chest. <clears throat> However, it's important to note that metaphor is not merely linguistic. Arnold Modell refers to metaphor as the bridge between knowledge and feelings and indicates that metaphor is fundamentally an embodied experience, not just language. Like language in general, metaphor is also embodied. Modell indicates that metaphor is now viewed as an emergent property of the mind. Metaphor is rooted in the body in two senses. Metaphor is used to organize bodily sensation cognitively, especially affects. And secondly, metaphor is rooted in the body as it rests on the border between mind and brain. Inchoate feelings that are cognitively unspecified require metaphors. At times, metaphorical experience may appeal to the intellect, but it reaches more deeply 
making connections on an emotional and imaginal level rather than solely cognitive. Metaphor is the process that allows sacred texts, music, art, poetry, dance, and film to move us, bringing our imaginations to life. Metaphor also influences our perceptions, anticipations, and preparedness for action. Modell asserts that we unconsciously interpret our affective world by means of metaphor in preparation for action, which is quite similar to a definition Jung offers for the archetype and its function, where he says, archetypes are systems of readiness for action. Modell goes on and states, as metaphor is the interpreter of feelings, our own and that of the other, we may pre-consciously construct simulated interactions that may or may not actually occur. An unconscious metaphoric process constructs a simulated anticipatory reality. Hence, metaphor is a pattern detector which recognizes similarities and differences applying them to past, present, and future. Analytical psychology of all the psychoanalytic therapies has the most highly refined relationship with metaphor. This deep connection with metaphor is one of the greatest assets of analytical psychology. Yet the metaphoric foundation of analytical psychology is often overshadowed by an emphasis on archetypes and symbols. Jung asserts that the psyche is mythopoetic, meaning that psyche creates myths. Yet myths are metaphors for ways of perceiving, experiencing, understanding, and being in the world. Concepts like myth, image, imaginal, and mythopoesis all involve metaphorical processes. Ultimately, I propose that it is not image that mediates the psyche, as Hillman attributes, nor the symbol, as Jung asserts, it is metaphor. Image and symbol are powerful psychic influences because they are imbued with metaphoric processes. Analytical psychologists often think of myths, fairy tales, religious motifs, and alchemy as representations of the collective unconscious and as potential symbols, but on the most fundamental level, all of these systems function as metaphors. The centrality of metaphor for analytical psychology is clearly stated by Jung. He says, an archetypal content expresses itself in metaphors. If such a content should speak of the sun and identify it with the lion, the king, the hoard of gold guarded by the dragon, or the power that makes for the life and health of man, it is neither the one thing nor the other, but the unknown third thing that finds more or less adequate expression in all of these similes. Even the best attempts at explanation are only more or less successful translations into other metaphorical language. I don't think it could be much clearer than that. I would like us to consider metaphor as the larger umbrella under which myths, fairy tales, religion, and alchemy are contained, as well as film, poetry, dance, literature, music, and art. The gift of metaphor is that allows us to see, feel, and speak about a living connection between elements of experience. It is primarily the metaphoric interpretation of experience in the here and now that provides an avenue for restoration and transformation. So just to give you a little bit of an example of the neuroscience behind metaphor, Research demonstrates that the brain engages powerfully and quite differently when encountering metaphor. These findings underscore the power of words and therefore interpretation. The enduring power of Shakespeare's works remind us that it is not the subject matter which invests words with power, but how those words are formed. The influence of Shakespeare's words can be demonstrated through neuroscience. Using fMRIs and EEGs, researchers studied functional shifts in brain activity when exposed to metaphor. They demonstrated how Shakespeare's metaphorical use of language creates shifts in mental pathways and opens new possibilities of thought, self-reflection, and associative connections. Volunteers in the study were recruited to read challenging prose, 
such as passages from Shakespeare's King Lear or Macbeth, while their neural activity was monitored. They were also asked to read passages of modern texts. Passages from Shakespeare significantly increased neural complexity and activity in the volunteers. The metaphorical passages associated with Shakespeare resulted in a distribution of activity bilaterally across both hemispheres of the brain, a state of the brain also actively associated with increased creativity and complex neural engagement. Whereas when they're reading ordinary prose, such as we might find in newspapers or nonfiction magazines, the activity of the brain was unicameral, only focused in one area of the brain and primarily located in the frontal cortex where we do most of our logical rational processing. The metaphoric passages re also resulted in more involvement of emotional centers of the brain. The researchers concluded that the human brain is optimized to respond powerfully to metaphor. So how does the metaphoric language of Shakespeare differ from normal language? Philip Davis, a professor of English literature and one of the researchers involved in the study, indicates that Shakespeare often introduced grammatical oddities or wordplay, creating numerous metaphors within his texts. Some examples of these grammatical shifts include making an adjective in my blood, in, in, into a verb, I'm sorry, an adjective into a blood. So thick my blood from winter's tail, or a father and a gracious aged man, him have you matted from King Lear. Sometimes he would make a pronoun into a noun. The cruelest she alive from the twelfth night. Or a noun is made into a verb. He childed as I fathered from King Lear. These studies underscore why it's critical to listen below the surface communications of our patients for the metaphors hidden within their stories and demonstrates why it is critical for the analytic therapist to frame interpretations in metaphorical language. In analytic therapy, effective interpretation is metaphoric because it makes a translation from one domain of experience to another. When the analytic session is experienced as a dream, as Ogden suggests, it becomes possible to engage all interaction and communication as potentially metaphoric thus permitting rich associative link linkages to emerge. Drawing to a close soon, given the perspectives on affect, symbol, metaphor, and imagination per, uh, presented in the previous sections, we can consider a revisioning of Jung's Liber Novus. Liber Novus leaves us with a rich example of deep engagement with the metaphorical psyche. In my view, the question of whether Jung's personal experiments with his psyche also reveals or provides evidence for the existence of the collective unconscious is only secondary. My initial response is to marvel at the unique metaphoric manifestations of the unconscious that emerged when Jung began his process of active imagination in 1913. In closing, I believe that the direction of analytical psychology could be powerfully influenced if Libra Novus were revisioned as an in inspiring example of the metaphorical processes of the human psyche, while focusing less on the prophetic revelatory qualities of its content. That's it, Mark. Thank That's you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you. Um, a uh, short uh, notice to the listeners, please put your, uh, write your questions into the chat box and then Paul will relay them to me. Uh, before we start, I want to add some, uh, uh, two quotes actually, one from Aristotle and one from uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, a philosopher of mind in uh, America. And Aristotle actually, which fits nicely into that, uh, what you said, said, <clears throat> uh, Aristotle says there are three kinds of word, words, strange, ordinary, and metaphorically. Mm. Strange words simply puzzle us, he says, mm. 
ordinary words convey what we know already, it is from metaphor that we can get hold of something new and fresh. And what does the freshness of metaphor consist? It's making mistakes. <laughs> from mistakes we learn. And a very important point, I think, from uh, Daniel Dennett, Dan Daniel Dennett, he says, uh, without or metaphor is a, is a tool of thinking and without a metaphor you can't uh, uh, talk about consciousness or psyche it's all the same does that go into your direction yes absolutely um I don't think that that's the point that Lakoff and Johnson and Turner are all making is that it's impossible for us to think without thinking in metaphor. And so, you know, even with the Higgs boson uh, particle uh, development that happened a few years ago, they had to create metaphors to explain to each other and to the public what was actually happening. And there was a brilliant uh, animation on uh, that the New York Times created to try to capture the essence of the Higgs boson, which has different properties at different times in different fields. And so the analogy they came up with and animated was the idea of uh, cross-country skiing through dry, fluffy snow as opposed to wet, slushy snow and the difference in that. Uh, so that, I think that's a wonderful illustration of what he, he's talking about. The other thing that comes to mind is a quote by Richard Finneman, who was a uh, well-known uh, mathematical physicist in the United States. And he's not speaking directly about metaphor, but he's really speaking about a related concept, imagination. And he said, science is just imagination in a straitjacket. Mm. So he uses a, a, a nice little metaphor to speak about science that really we're utilizing imagination in science, but there's a certain set of parameters that have to be worked within uh, in order for that work to get done. Uh, um, uh, quantum theory actually is full of metaphors. Because oh, yeah. You can't talk about it. And uh, the funniest, I think, is comes from William James, the American uh, psychologist, uh, 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 Niels Bohr borrowed one of the main concepts, complementarity from him, yes? Mm -hmm. And Erwin Schrödinger's entanglement, these uh, came from carpentry, yes? And then everybody knows about black holes and so on and so forth. So, and, and string theory. Yeah, yeah even the name. It's, uh, yeah, it's even the name it's itself. It's with strings, but somehow mm -hmm. you have to imagine it. Yeah. Now let me come to the questions. Maria Magdalena, she asked, thanks for the uh, provocative presentation. Can you say something uh, of how trauma affects our capacity to tune in with the realm of effects and how this broken space within psyche impairs our capacity to build a metaphor? Well, actually what we're trying to do is restore metaphoric capacity. And so uh, there's a, a parallel term from literature called metemony. And metemony kind of does the opposite of um, metaphor, whereas metaphor builds connections through similarities as well as differences. Metemony takes one characteristic and applies it to an entire group. So when we say heavy is the brow, that wears the crown. We're talking about all monarchs, but we're attributing one characteristic to all people who are monarchs. Or when we talk about the suits, and we refer, we're referring to bankers and insurance salesmen and financiers, we're attributing a particular quality to all of them that we associate with the idea of wearing a suit. So this is where metaphor actually breaks down and one class is attributed to an entire group. So in trauma, if somebody has a neighbor that they like as a child, they like to go over and play with. And one time their friend goes for an errand with their mother 
and the father is there alone and the child gets molested or sexually assaulted. And the metemony that the child forms in their mind is that I'm alone with an older man. And then they might apply that atemony, metemony across situations as adults, like getting onto an elevator, for example, where there's only one man involved. So this metemony is working within their psyche. And our goal in engaging trauma is to help the person see how the world has become limited by this metemony based in experience and affect and somatic response and help restore the capacity for metaphor. Ula Maria asks, can we also consider metaphor as being the root of other fields of knowledge such as medicine, the doctrine of signatures, for example, alchemy, chemistry? Oh, I think without a doubt. I mean, I think that's what exactly what uh, Lockoff and Johnson and Turner, uh, they, they've published so many books on metaphor and its role in cognition and the development of thought. And they all apply to exactly what you're talking about, that we don't come to new understandings without metaphor. And new understandings build out of old understandings through metaphor. And that's in, uh, an important consideration in terms of analytical psychology developing as a field is that when we feel a romantic attachment to Jung's original ideas and we lose the capacity to re-examine them and we hold on to them because they appeal to us, we've lost the capacity to develop as a field. And that's why I wanted to emphasize uh, the contrast between archetypal theory as it was previously held and how it's currently being re-examined and to some degree re-metaphorized, one could say. And I think it's essential for us, just as psychoanalysis has developed dramatically since Freud's death in 1939 and over the same period of time, I would say analytical psychology has not had the same freedom of movement of thought that has occurred in psychoanalysis. Yeah. Uh, Nomi posits, uh, it is not possible to think without being metaphorically, metaphorical. Uh, what's the difference in this than what Jung states? Never mind that the way he is often understood without reading, he structures, he, he structured and dynamics, his structured and dynamic books, I guess. Did you get that? Yeah, I think I get the gist of it, Nomi. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think Jung was probably more appreciative of metaphor as a process than the people who followed after him. And that it's, it's not so much how Jung limited his concepts, it's how we limit Jung's concepts in the present. Uh, and so I, for me, the more cross-theoretical dialogue we have with other schools of psychoanalytic thought, uh, in a sense, that allows us not necessarily to adopt all of those thoughts, but to contrast them with thoughts we hold. And that new new meanings may occur and perhaps one day we won't we won't even think of ourselves as Jungians per se just as most psychoanalysts no longer think of themselves as Freudians they see Freud as one of the originators but they don't it's not their identity any longer and so in some way I hope all of us that work in this field of the unconscious in the field of psyche come to see ourselves as perhaps mining different or perhaps uh, growing certain uh, or growing in certain elements of the secret garden together rather than seeing us as being opposed because there's so many ideas from psychoanalysis that have now grown psychoanalysis mm -hmm. towards the very ideas that Jung proposed. And if we can learn how to communicate our own ideas in a more fluid way, like focusing less on the notion of archetype and more on the notion of metaphor, uh, 
I think we'll find a more receptive audience amongst psychoanalysts. Yeah, I think this is a very important point. The unions are a little bit uh, closed and they need to be uh, opening up to other ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and not just from psychoanalysis. Obviously, yeah. in, in my presentation, I'm drawing a lot on neuroscience and cognitive science and philosophy that's yeah. not, not directed at you, the Jungian world or the psychoanalytic world at all. The only field where it's done a little bit is in physics, but exactly, uh, uh, neuroscience and philosophy, and this needs to be taken care of as well. There's a question from Dennis Merritt. <clears throat> it seems the archetype, archetypal realm as emergent beyond the complexes put one into the symbolic that is deeper and more basic than language. Near-death experiences and vision quests and big dreams seem to be special levels more commonly associated with archetypal realm. Okay, and my question in return would be, what do we gain by thinking of those as archetypal as opposed to metaphoric? Because the concept of archetype is a metaphorical one as well. Right. Right, that it is metaphorical. So even in these deep, deeper realms that Dennis is describing, and I agree there's certainly different levels of depth of experience, but do we gain anything in terms of, uh, of an explanatory vehicle by calling it archetype rather than metaphor? A um, little bit running out of questions here. Uh, there's another one from Nomi. Uh, how how would you, you, Mark, understand the distinction between metaphor as universal, to which Jung would agree, and symbol being effectively propelled into consciousness? Well, what I would say is a symbol is a metaphor that has a unique uh, meaning to that individual. As Jung says, um, what determines whether something is a symbol or not is largely the consciousness that perceives it. So something that may be metaphoric for me may not be metaphoric at all to somebody else. Yeah. And therefore something that's symbolic to me may not be symbolic to somebody else. So he's placing it exactly in the center of subjectivity. The impact of the symbol is rooted in the person's subjectivity not in the collectivity of it. Mm. I think the the power of using a metaphor is to force, and maybe force is a little bit strong, strong word, uh, to force a change in paradigm or to uh, change uh, of uh, view. And uh, uh, this, I think, in this lies the power of your argument. Mm -hmm. uh, bringing, bringing in other sciences, if you want. Right, but changing also the subjective point of view through non-rational means. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. And here we are with uh, Suzanne Langer. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Paul, I need your help. <laughs> How? Question. You want you to generate more questions. Yes. Oh, well, I generated one of my own. You need to read down the uh, WhatsApp. What I was thinking was, I'm thinking of different directions that you go and that can be gone. Mm -hmm. when you're looking for this metaphor as common to all of these things. There is a, it's not necessarily reductive, but each time you leave one frame to see the metaphorical essence of it, you are leaving something behind, right? Even though I've been sort of fighting with writing about archetype myself lately, and I know that archetype is frequently a thing that has subjected us to a lot of inflation, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, my California background, all of those things from the 80s and 90s of people writing books about how great archetypes are, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is a little, you know, that's pretty dodgy. Uh, 
But at the same time, I think we have more of a charge to it, more respect to it, more attention for it in that form than we would if it were only about complex and only about archetype. You know, what Patricia uh, says is brilliant, but at the same time, if it were really only complex psychology, it might feel a little more two-dimensional than it does. But then is that something of a romantic uh, connection to the process? If we, if we feel sad about losing the notion of archetype, now I'm, I want to emphasize I'm not advocating giving up archetype as an explanatory vehicle. What I'm adv advocating for is to see it more broadly Okay. As part of a category of metaphor, you know, I find some of the contemporary arguments revisioning archetype compelling, but I don't know that I've even made a decision myself yet about whether I find them completely compelling. They're interesting to me, and I think they're worth considering. And what my emphasis is, is I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. I'm interested in what works in my consulting room. And for me, it's made my own thought processes, my affective processes, much more fluid and available to me, thinking about all of this stuff as metaphor. And then I hear metaphor when somebody's talking about flushing the toilet or taking a photograph with their camera or uh, weeping at a bird flying up from the grass then it all becomes metaphorical on some level and I can listen to all communications in a much richer, deeper way rather than thinking, oh, is that an archetype that's just popped up in this dream? Okay. Well, let me give an absolutely completely unfair counterexample. Okay. One of my patients who is a professional psychologist um, underwent Lacanian analysis back in the late 90s when he was having a difficult time and doing too many drugs and being very young and a lot of art and all of this. And he said it was really valuable because at the end of it, everything was in black and white. Mm -hmm. That's his assessment, his personal response to a particular technique. But one of the reasons he wanted to come to me was he would assume in a structure that took archetypes seriously that things would never be reduced to black and white. I understand yeah. that that can get taken in all sorts of directions, but mm -hmm. I've always thought of that as very important. Yeah. And again, I, I, I still use classical archetypal material at times. You know, I still tell myths and fairy tales when it's appropriate. Uh, I still bring that, but I'm also just as likely to bring in film or poetry or song lyric, depending on what's coming up in my reverie as long as there is an affective charge to it and I can see the metaphor, the metaphorical connection between my reverie and what somebody's speaking about, that's what really allows me to shift into a metaphorical mode of speaking. Like one of the examples I give in uh, the book is an older uh, gay male who had difficulty with affect modulation and didn't really particularly anger and did not seem at all concerned about the impact of his anger on his partner or on others around him. And then he was speaking one day about making a trip up to see his mother who was near death and whether his partner should go along with him and his irritation at the thought of having his partner present and having to attend to his partner's needs and his fear that, or his not fear per se, but his assumption that he would get angry and blow up at his partner. And so the image of a terrorist bomber came to mind. And I said um, to him, so it's like you want to strap when you feel the pressure of other people's expectations, you strap on a suicide vest and blow everything up, including yourself. Okay. And that became quite an important image for him. That if I had spoken in any other language about 
appropriateness of anger or to think about what that was doing to his partner, it would have had no effect whatsoever. There's a personal question from Magdalena. She asks you, what made you take this road you are presenting to us today? Is it? Um, I, I suppose it's a long outgrowth. Um, apparently, uh, in listening to some uh, tapes I made while I was a candidate, I was referring to metaphor then. Uh, but I, I can't point to one thing. It's just continuing to... Uh, I think part of it is my exposure to the idea of reverie and what's happening in reverie and what we're trying to connect with in reverie. And then just the accumulation of experience of what works and what doesn't seem to work in analysis, what's transformative, what moves to deeper depths. And for me, thinking broadly about metaphor and having an interest in music and poetry and literature and film, uh, you know, it was just a slow evolution uh, to this point. Uh, maybe the final question from Dennis Merritt, uh, or it's more rather a comment. To put metaphor into the archetypal realm, think of Hermes as the god of metaphors and emergent phenomena. Mm. It is a special dimension of Jungian psychology. Yeah, I think that's a nice way of putting it, Dennis. Uh, so certainly since Hermes is the crosser of boundaries and that metaphor crosses domains of experience. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful way of summarizing and putting it into, putting metaphor, the action of metaphor into archetypal language. Yeah, that's a very good point. So I think we can close here. Thank you, Mark, for your presentation. Thank you. Leaves a lot of people are stunned, obviously, because there's <laughs> not so many questions. And I only have a comment for our next session. Uh, this will be the ninth session, will take place on the 14th of October. And Monica Lucci will talk about the restructuring of space, the restructuring of self individual and group psychic skin in the time of Corona. And then in November, we have uh, Joe Cambre and uh, in December, Nancy Krieger. Okay, thank you very much to all of you. Special command. All right, thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. See you in a month.